What's up, guys? We've got some mental health awareness today. My guest is Sarah Schley, and she's going to be talking all about bipolar. Um, Sarah is amazing. Uh, she's an international business consultant. She served over 50 enterprises and thousands of individuals, including leaders such as Eileen Fisher, Nike, MIT, and Ben and Jerry's. Um, what, in her early life, Sarah went from being a varsity athlete, a 4.0 GPA student, and just being accepted to one of the top medical schools to suddenly literally feeling like she couldn't even add two plus two. Okay. So her, her brain, as she describes, you'll hear her in the episode, she felt like an alien had abducted her brain. Like it, it was not functioning. And so it took her 25 years to figure out what was actually going on. 25 years. Can you believe that? And, um, she's, she learned that she had bipolar two, which is on what she's describing as a bipolar spectrum. And I think that's, such good awareness because even though there are 70 million people suffering from bipolar, there's so much misdiagnosis, lack of self-understanding, shame and stigma around mental health issues, which is a personal thing for me because I feel like uh, my own mom was very underserved in her life because of the shame and stigma around mental health issues. Mental health issues are just health issues. There's no need to be ashamed of it. And, and, and I love that Sarah is talking about how to one, recognize you know, what that might look like, kind of how to know if, if you or someone you love might be suffering from bipolar. She has some cool questions you can kind of ask yourself. Um, and then she talks about um, understanding the difference between bipolar one and bipolar two, which I share in the episode. I just found that out like a month or two ago uh, from my friend who's really into mental health stuff. I didn't even know that there were two types, you know, and she calls it a spectrum, which I love. And I'll let her share about that. She has, um, uh, different opinions, I'd say, than some of, even though she's very much into holistic health, she's talking about, you know, sometimes medication serves a role. And I agree with her. I agree with her. So sorry if that makes you angry, but um, I think, you know, I share in the episode, sometimes we get a little, I would say, um, dogmatic, even about our holistic approaches, you know, so I think it's healthy to be open-minded and to know what we don't know, you know, and to listen and have an open mind to what people are experiencing, you know? So anyway, she's just uh, incredible. She's a coach herself, you know? So she's like, Hey, I want to interview you too. <laughs> just on the episode. Cause we're both, you know, you, you'll see, she just has an amazing personality. So just love her to death. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Here is Sarah Schley. Before we get in the show, I wanted to make sure that you guys knew about two awesome things that I have going on right now in my company. The first is my next hire retreat, which is going to be in Maui, Hawaii. This is May 10th through 14th. Please check it out at taragarrison.com slash retreat, and it will redirect you to that page. This is going to be focused all on physical health. So my retreats from now on will be focused on one of our four peaks of hire, which are personal, physical, professional, and people, which are like the four key areas of life that we focus on. And this retreat is all focused on physical. So we're doing a biohacking buffet, a biomechanics class, the mindsets behind physical transformation you might be missing. We're also doing health the way I feel like it should be done. And that is having fun, playing outside, hanging out with cool people. We're going to be surfing, spending some time at the beach, hula dancing, so many amazing things. So if you want to check that out again, it's taragarrison.com slash retreats. And, um, the other thing is a new coaching offer that I have. I'm very excited about this. This is my path to being able to help more people. And so I have offered a group coaching form of higher coaching. What that involves is a private coaching community, a group coaching call with me once a week. And you also get access to my coach Tara app included in this and access to every single program that I have ever released all in a vault for my higher coaching clients. So very excited about that. It is only $297 a month. So significantly discounted from my private coaching. So if that's interesting to you, please check it out at taragarrison.com. You'll just see it right there on my homepage, or you can go directly to the taragarrison.com slash higher dash coaching. All right, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right, Sarah, I told you before we started, I'm very grateful for you being a voice um, for mental health awareness. Um, it's also awesome that you have such an incredible coaching background with big corporations and transformations. So like, you know, human behavior, you know, what's needed in order for people to heal and come into uh, a place of thriving in their life. And that, you know, you, you went on your own personal journey with this, your book, yeah. it's, which is called brainstorm from broken to blessed on the bipolar spectrum telling your life story. And I think it's an, also important to note that you went from 
like thriving as a varsity athlete, 4.0 GPA, accepted to a top medical school. So, and then boom, just right. that, then that broken feeling came in out of nowhere. And then you found your way out. And I am so grateful. I always say, I feel like the universe supports those of us who like to share because it's like, okay, give her all the tools out of this. So she can share that with other people. And I, yeah, I feel like that's absolutely. what you're doing. So thanks for writing the book. I've written a book. Is not an easy task. <laughs> it is a big right. undertaking. But let's let's go back into your journey a little bit, if you don't mind sharing um, how you found out what was going on. Because I'm sure at first it was just very confusing. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Tara. It's really nice to meet you. Um, so yeah, I mean, in the book and TED Talks and everyone, I start with is this looks like a nice middle aged lady with you know a beautiful life with kids and grandkids and good guy husband and all that stuff and the company that I founded that's worked with international corporations and, but that's just the surface of the story. Mm -hmm. um, because when I was 21 and at that time, kind of a rock star kid, like you said, 4.0, headed to medical school, gang of friends. And then one day it was as if like a switch had flipped in my brain and my brain had been abducted by an alien. And all of a sudden, you know, I couldn't add two plus three when I, you know, was heading to medical school, I had ACE calculus in science. I couldn't, I was too scared to leave my room. I was, you know, I, I locked myself in and wouldn't see friends. Um, and, you know, things like, right, navigation. I couldn't even find my way to class. It was, it was a total abduction of my brain and a tailspin into kind of a terrifying hell because what was going on? You know, the, I had never experienced anything like this before. I'd never experienced any kind of a breakdown before. Mm. Oh, so, yeah. So that was the first. That's four decades ago. Yeah, yeah. So like- <laughs> What was, you know, I, I'm assuming it was very scary. Did you have someone you could confide in? You know, what was your first path on that? Did you kind of hold it all inside and pretend like it wasn't happening or what did that, where'd you go from? Yeah, that's a really that good place? question. Uh, I had, you know, a couple friends that I, I've, out of all my friends, I think I knew one who'd been to a therapist. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt comfortable kind of telling her what was going on. Um, my mother also went through severe depressions when I was growing up. So I'm pretty sure I might've told my siblings. I don't actually remember, mm -hmm. um, but I'm pretty sure I told the three upper upper siblings. I'm the youngest of four that I was feeling depressed like mom, mm -hmm. uh, because that would have been something that was out because we all grown up with that, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure it took a while to find help and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So what, what did, what happened in your, you know, did you continue to go to college? What, you know, what was the uh, next phase of your life? Like, Just right. Yeah, it turned out that was like a month before I, I was about to graduate. I finished a semester early. So um, my last class, you know, I got like a C minus and I'd never gotten anything below an A, but it was enough credits just to finish. So I kind of like dragged myself over the finish line. Wow. And then after that, for the next several months, I still lived in my apartment with my friends because they were going to graduate in June and I'd finished in January. But, um, you know, it was pretty terrifying. I didn't know. I, I, I. I didn't know how to relate to anybody. And I'd go back and forth. I went to school in Providence. My parents are in Boston. I'd go up to Boston to see them. And I, you know, then I just wanted to leave them and go back to school. And then when I'd be at school, I wanted to leave them. It was very, um, I don't know what to say other than uh, chaotic and miserable and terrifying mm. for those next several months. So, you know, I read that it took you 25 years and five psychiatrists to find out what was going on. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. You, you know, I, I assuming, you know, I, I think I read that but at first it was like, well, let's just get you on an antidepressant and bye. Is that kind of the path that you were? Well, what happened was, and we talked a little bit before this or a little bit around your history was that I resisted medication for about two decades because my mom had been on, they didn't want to be like that even right. though God bless her, she's in the next world. She did the best she could, but mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to be like that. So I was, you know, I was going to try every alternative therapy, you know, healthy eating, positive thinking, you know, workouts, yoga, meditation, every alternative therapist before I would get on medication. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that for like 20 some years. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, you know, mm -hmm. and I think all of those behaviors are really healthy for anybody. And I recommend them and they've been yes. good. Look at me. I'm in 60. I look pretty good. Right. Yes, Teasing. But, um, but I, I, uh, I, I really recommend those behaviors, but if you have a bipolar brain or some other genetic, you know, chemical malfunction, mm -hmm. they're not going to be enough. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to be really important 
but not sufficient. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and I can get into later about the diamond four approaches. One is medication therapy, good behaviors, et cetera. Um, but so with me, it wasn't until I was like early forties, I had little kids and one of my kids had, um, a very serious breathing issue. She's doing great now. She's in her 20s. She's great. It took us many years to figure out what was wrong. It turned out it was just a blood vessel wrapped around her trachea. But at the time, we were going to ER all the time. And I was in a severe depression. And I knew I had to have my brain back online because when I'm depressed like that, my my brain isn't working. It's like the, the switch flips and nothing computes. I had to do something so that I could figure out what's going on with my kid. Uh, and so I finally consented and a friend dragged me to a psychiatrist. Mm. Um, and that's when they put me on antidepressants because mm. they thought I was just depressed. Cause right. I was depressed. so then we got to get into the whole bipolar spectrum, but let me take yeah. a see where you want to go next. Well, I'm curious, you know, uh, not knowing at the time, anything about the bipolar part, you know, what was that knowing now, and we'll get into the different types of bipolar, which I'm excited for you to educate about, because I, as I told you, I'm like, I just found out about this like a month ago. I didn't even know there were two types of bipolar. So you didn't know anything really what was going on with you, except that you were battling depressive moments in time that got really intense and you couldn't even think straight. And so what I'm just curious, for someone who later is going to find out that there's bipolar involved, what was the, just the antidepressant experience like for you? Okay. So what happened for me, and this I understand because I've been working with a lot of doctors is true um, for a lot of folks with bipolar. It'll, antidepressant can seem like it's working and then it'll make you worse. Mm. Okay. So that, or they, sometimes they call it Prozac poop out. That's the technical term. Mm-hmm. Um, you feel better and then you get much worse. Mm-hmm. And in my case, that's what happens. So then they try and you go in, you, you go into a psychiatrist's office or a doctor's office looking depressed. They write you a script for an antidepressant. You come back worse. And if they don't know about the bipolar spectrum, they go, oh, she's more depressed. Let's give her more antidepressant. So you see, it's a vicious cycle because you're just getting worse and worse. The practitioner thinks because they haven't been trained about bipolar spectrum. uh, They have a mental model that you're depressed. They give you the wrong drug. So um, and it's not true for everybody, but a lot of cases and certainly in mine, that antidepressant can make you much worse. Hmm. You know, suicidal ideation, anxiety, up. Uh, late nights, um, and it triggers mania. So Mm. how did you diagnose it? Several years later, five psychiatrists, you know, um, 25 years since the beginning, the fifth guy um, was dedicated to understanding the complexity of bipolar. And he'd studied, he'd been to conferences his whole life. And he went to the International Society of Bipolar Disorder Conference on and on. So what he had was he when he listened to my symptoms, he was thinking through the lens of bipolar because he knew that it could be more than just Mm -hmm. the classic mania, right? And so he had a bipolar spectrum diagnostic test, only 15 questions. And in the span of 15 minutes, he had diagnosed what had eluded the medical world for 25 years. Mm. Do you want to hear the questions? Yes, please. (laughs) You got them? Did you have your... Did you have your first incident in your early 20s? Yes, I did. Do you have family with with, um, mood swing history? Yeah, my mother and my grandfather both suffered terribly. My mom called it the cruelest disease. We watched that all growing up. Mm -hmm. And here's the key, what I think was the key. And when you were given antidepressants, did you start to feel better and then get worse? And maybe did it even trigger mania? Yeah. And you'd never had mania before? Correct. It was triggered by the wow. antidepressant. He goes, done. We know what you have. <laughs> wow. wow. I still didn't believe him because I, my fifth psychiatrist and I was really, uh, what's the word, um, skeptical at that point. Mm. Um, and I was kind of without hope at that point, but I just keep dragging myself because I had little kids or I had friends drag me, to tell the truth. Um, and he gave me the medication for bipolar and I got better. Wow. It was awesome. a miracle. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm very interested to hear about your diamond because, you know, as being a holistic health coach, I, I say this all the time. I'm like, listen, I love holistic modalities when yeah. it comes to mental health issues. 
Like, I'm not convinced that we don't know why people have ups and downs in these certain neurotransmitters. That's not completely yeah. fully understood yet, you know? Right. And so I'm like, I'm not ever going to say like, oh, just meditate and eat healthy food. And then your mental health issue that's genetic is going to go, I mean, you know, <laughs> Thank so, you, Tara. yeah. yeah. So, Cause I had, I had psychics and people who were so shaming and they make me mad and rich, right. but I just want to go buy them and go, right. you were so arrogant. You had no idea. One right. said, Oh, just open your crown chakra. It's in the book and you'll get better. I'm like, so now I know that's such BS. Right. And you right. actually, you actually shame people and you actually do them harm. Yeah. You know, some, one guy said he would, he could see my aura and he was going to, you know, take out some alien again. Right. Yes. Right. 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 So in well, my, I be, go ahead. I'll just say real quick on that. Like I, I have found that even in the holistic and healing world, we have somewhat modeled um, Western medicine by being overly specialized in our area. So the energetic healer thinks it's all, you know, it's a, you mm -hmm. got a, you got a demon inside you. Sorry. Yeah. I'm not trying. I, I love yeah. energy healers. So I don't mean anything, yeah, me but, too, but they, so they kind of go in that path or the gut health person is like, it's all gut health or the, right. you know, the nutritionist is like, it's all nutrition, the, the yeah. you know, and so mm -hmm. I am not surprised that you ran into that. And I just have to say, it's like, I feel like it's very important for all of us to recognize what we don't know. Right. Exactly. Like, Thank I am you. Not, I am not a mental health specialist. I have not studied the brain and the synapses and all that, you know, so yeah. gotta have humility. Yeah. I know my husband, I don't, we don't know who he's quoting, but I love this line, which says, um, say, stay close to people who are seeking the truth and far from those who found it. Yes, that's exactly okay, yes. Too complicated. curious, curious right. open minds that are willing to be like, I, I don't know, yeah. but I wonder who does. And I wonder what that. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about these four, the, the diamond, yeah. you know, what, what yeah, are these yeah. four things? Because remember, I'm holistic like you. I'm the last person that want to take medication. I'm all right. organic, you know, I live right. in the woods. So, but mm -hmm. when I finally surrendered to, hey, you have this genetic, you know, honorable genetic inheritance of a bipolar gene, you know, right. meditation's not going to fix it, kiddo. Now, maybe someday it will, but not. Right. not. Right. So right. I, the diamond, it was, it's four prongs, which I actually learned from Dr. Holly Schwartz and Dr. Trisha Supes, they're uh, Pittsburgh and Stanford, respectively. Um, and they said, I made up the diamond. They had the four and I put it into a diamond. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's simply, if it's a, if it's a mental health situation, medication, therapy, your support networks of friends and family, and fourth, all the behaviors that you're going to do that are going to serve you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, physical, emotional, creative, spiritual. And I actually have, now I have a YouTube channel, my own very uh, proud of, because I'm a boomer and I don't know how to do that. Uh, but it's called PEX, Practices for Healthy Brain. And PEX mm -hmm. stands for physical, emotional, creative, and spiritual, the four worlds. I love Flexible that you PEX. put creative in there. Beautiful. Yeah, you got to put that on there. Fire. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, and I have, you know, really religious discipline to those practices because they're good preventive medicine. You know, they yeah. keep me on right. an even keel along with my medication, along with my friends and family. Right. Personally, I don't need therapy right now because I've been through decades of it. But if I come, if I have a tough situation, boom, I'm going to be right there. I got my therapist on call. Yeah, you beautiful. So, I love that. Um, you know, we, I, I really wanted to hit on the bipolar one and bipolar two, because I think a lot of people, this might be their first time hearing that there's two yep. types of bipolar. Can you describe the differences? Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually why I wrote the book you mentioned. It says from broken to blessed on the bipolar spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, brainstorm, because I wanted people to say, bipolar spectrum what's that i never heard of bipolar spectrum. i know there's an autistic spectrum i think there's a sexuality right. spectrum you know right. what's this so um it turns out that there is um when we hear if, if i asked you to describe and i say the word bipolar a month ago when you didn't know <laughs> and i said what is that what comes to your mind tara when i say bipolar what do you see uh mood swings uh you know i i, I what what typically you know you hear is like I hear, you know, you, I've never heard the one and two, but I'll hear, well, it's more like, you know, for months at a time, you're kind of like, 
uh, either depressed or like, you know, at, you know, baseline. And then you go into these manic episodes and you go into depressive episodes or it's like, yeah. well, some people it's like, that's faster, but there's not, that's it. You know, that's yeah. pretty much the general knowledge that I have come across. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah like that. Most people I ask will say, uh, erratic mood swings, extreme highs, wild, you know, un irresponsible behaviors. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And that is, they're only describing the far extreme of the bipolar spectrum, mm -hmm. what's known as bipolar one, uh, manic depression, right? Way up, way down. Yes. Now it turns out there's a whole spectrum, not only bipolar two, which I'm, I'm uh, categorized as, but all the way down bipolar one, all the way to unipolar depression, which is depressed in oh, the middle. There's all, all this range of bipolar and the range is, uh, bipolar without mania. Who's ever heard of that? You mean you could have bipolar, but not get manic. Right. That's right. No, no right. One talks about so that. no one talks about that. And it doesn't even make sense because you're bipolar at their two poles. Well, it's, it's the high isn't really high. It's like, we're, we have high energy. Mm. You know, if you, I'm people would think of me as high energy and make stuff happen, but that's not much more than the average bear, certainly in my family. Um, but we have bipolar without mania. And what that means is it's very commonly misdiagnosed as regular depression, given the wrong drugs get worse, you know, dangerous, even lethal side effects. Right. But if, if somebody asks the right questions, like my doctor with a very simple bipolar, uh, bipolar spectrum diagnostic test, you can identify this person's bipolar, given the right drugs, that's going to make them better. Hmm. So I'm curious, like bipolar without mania, are you saying that there's depressive episode? You know, this is like, if you haven't been diagnosed, you're not getting help or whatever. Yeah. There's like depressive times and then it's not quite mania, but it's just higher energy times. Right. Yeah, That's exactly. Yeah. But it's not yeah. full on. It, like It's not full on mania. So it mm -hmm. would, it gets missed. It doesn't get diagnosed right because, oh, that's a high energy person. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, they may have periods where they're, you know, excited about stuff, but yeah, a lot of artists do, you know, or a lot right. of people do. So right. it gets missed. And really the way to diagnose it is through that diagnostic spectrum test, which is out in the public domain. And I actually have a link to it on my website. Um, and so my, the doctors, the psychiatrists that I know who specialize in bipolar two and the bipolar spectrum, they would just say, screen for bipolarity, screen for bipolarity, screen for bipolarity. Because guess who writes the most scripts for antidepressants? Hint, is it psychiatrists? Just medical doctors. Yeah. General practitioners. Right, the family doctor, right. Family doc, 79% of scripts wow, written for antidepressants 70. by family docs. How much psychiatric training do they have? Oh my gosh, right. One month. It's the band aid. It's like, oh, you're depressed. I know. I mean, exactly. And, and no offense. Here's an aspirin. Right. No, I mean, but it's, it's at the same time, it's like a referral would probably be nice if you're not really sure, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and a lot of times, I mean, I go on and on on this because I've been doing a lot of research now for talks mm -hmm. and TED talks and stuff, but um, the they're doing the best they can. Yes. Yeah. They're not trained. My niece right. just went through it. I asked her, she's now a medical resident in PCP. Molly, did you get any, what training, psychiatric training you did one month? Okay. Right. Meantime, most psychiatric inquiries begin, begin in your primary care doctor office because people either don't go to psychiatrists because there's a stigma or don't go to psychiatrists because there aren't any. Right. They're all on the coast. There's, mm. check this out. One psychiatrist for every 28,000 Americans. Really? Wow. And most of them are on the coasts and wow. Texas. That's insane. Yeah. So- yeah. Anyway, so the thing is like screen for bipolarity, ask yeah. these questions, you may find out, or if somebody's been depressed and the antidepressants aren't working, several antidepressants aren't working, check it out, mm. get the book or get, go to the website and find the test, ask your, your doctor or psychiatrist, could they screen for bipolarity? That's great advice. And um, we'll link up your, your website as well. So people can find that link on there. I'm mm -hmm. curious, like if somebody's listening to this and they're kind of wondering if someone in their family or a close friend might have bipolar, what are some things that they could look for as someone who cares about that person? That's a really great question. 
Um, cause people have asked me, you know, they're saying, I wish I, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't know for me. Right. Right. You know, I'm like, I feel so bad. I'm like, honey, don't feel bad. You know, and it can be knows. subtle, you know, it's like, it's uh, hard to notice sometimes it's like, Oh, they might just be in a really good mood. And like, I don't know what's going on with them. You know, even teenagers or more like, like they're going to be depressed if they have bipolar too. you, you'll see the depression part. Yeah. Um, so I think what you might see is um, it's unrelenting. It doesn't respond to antidepressants or if it seems to, and then stops, that's a key. Mm. If this if Prozac okay. is going along for six months and then crash, they feel worse. That's another off. Now I'm not a doctor. I have to be right. careful. Just from from your experience. But, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, and it's really important that people don't, don't take any medical advice from me. Yes. <laughs> uh, but I think they could look for that. Um, they could, Go on, there's a website called psycheducation.org. We should link that too, because that's Dr. Jim Phelps. He's the guy who in his book was the uh, diagnostic test that saved my life. And that website ha- is all de- dedicated to the bipolar spectrum. And there's tons of information there. Mm. So I think that would be a good place to go and look. Okay, great. Thank you. And another thing is, you know, I know I've noticed from the people in my life who I've known who have had mental health issues that. I feel like what prevents them from speaking up is shame, right? Um, it, it, this tendency to keep it silent and just do it alone and like not tell anybody about right. what's going on. And so if anybody's listening and they're in that place and they're, you know, there's shame stigma, or I don't want to inconvenience everybody with my stuff or like whatever these stories are, what would yeah. you say to that person? Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it, when you're in the throes of the disease, it's worse because your depression will tell you nobody wants to hear it. Right. Like it will tell you you're not good enough. It will tell you you're a burden. So it's even worse mm-hmm. um, than just regular. So yeah, there's a vast social stigma in this country against mental illness. Um, and I think, you know, I just, re- I write about like what my mentor told me, she's, she had something similar and she said, this is not your fault. This is genetic. This is physical. Um, there's no shame here. Just say yes to help. Yeah. Um, that's on the side of the, of the person that, you know, that's suffering the person that's, that's also trying to ha- that wants to be of service. I call them emergency medical health team, EMHT, EMT. Um, so I say there's four things you want to hear them. Yeah. <laughs> Thing one, reach in, don't expect them to reach out. They won't mm. because of all the shame we're talking about. You make the phone calls, you knock on their door. Okay. Like I've done it even myself when I'm feeling well, I'll say, Oh, just reach out if you need me. They won't. Yeah. You got to knock on the door, make the phone call. If you think they're having a hard time. Then the second one is um, don't try to fix it. You can't, Mm. you just, you have to listen with unconditional love and presence. Mm. And that's a key thing about decreasing the shame and the stigma Yes, because you're showing up with your loving presence is hugely healing that in itself. Okay. So you don't try to fix it but be present and show up and listen, right? Mm. They're going to, that, that's like, they're not alone on this island of despair. You've, you've come to meet them on the island and that's massive. Um, that's a de-shamer. That's a shame eraser. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the, the, um, trying to fix it means, oh, there's something wrong with you. In case you're already thinking something was wrong with you. I just want to yeah. confirm to you that I also think something's wrong with you and I'm going to help you fix it. It's like, uh, and, it's, and whatever you're going to offer is not going to work, even right. though you want to. If they have a real brain imbalance, you know, right. just listen, just listen, you know, then, you know, if you want to do something, yeah, you can drag them to the doctors. You can um, fill the freezer, pick up the kids, do the laundry, because I think what people don't understand, like if it's cancer, people do that. They rally for their friends. Mm-hmm. If it's depression and bipolar, they don't see it. They don't see that my brain's not working and I can't do the dishes. Right. right my friends began to know and they started filling my freezer because I had little kids and I couldn't cook. Mm. So you can do practical things like that. You can't fix their depression or their brain, but you can show up and help. Show up. Yeah. And the last thing I say is create a posse because you can't do this by yourself. You're going to burn out. So get the gang around this person. Mm. Okay. I'll fill the freezer. You pick up kids, you drag them to the doctors, you know, you have to create a posse. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, I always think of this analogy because we, you know, we talked before about, I I feel like my mom never got the mental health help that she needed because of the stigma and shame, you know, she was very extremely defensive if it even got mildly suggested, you know, and, and I look at it, you know, just having experienced that my whole life, like I look at it as 
if you had a major surgery or broke your leg, it like it's socially acceptable for right. people to come fill your freezer, help you yeah. out, help with things, you know. But if it's but if it's mental, nope, you're on your own. Like right. nobody, and it, that's not. It doesn't make any sense, you know. But yeah. and, and that but that's what I feel like the people who are suffering feel like 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 they're somehow not worthy of help. Right. Or right. and I'm a burden. It's like, dude, no, like you, it's just as if you had surgery or a broken bone or, you know, and it's like, what? Okay. So the people in your life can't help you ongoing. And then they're probably right. not the people you need in your life, you know, exactly. but it's yeah. like welcoming that is, is, is beautiful. And people want to, you know, yep. people want to help. Oh, that's the thing too. I mean, so many people after I wrote the book came up to me, like I said, said, Oh my, I'm so sorry. I wasn't there for you, <laughs> you know, or my cousin, my niece, my brother did that. What can I do to help them? I feel like a deer in the headlights. I don't know how to help. And then I give them the four things. I love it. Um, but also just to what you just said, also my mentor, she said, look, if you had diabetes, you take insulin. You know, if you had heart disease, you might take blood thinners. If you have asthma, you'd use an inhaler. That's pancreas, heart, lungs. Why is the brain different? This is a physical thing. <laughs> you yeah. didn't do anything wrong, but yes. you're right. It takes a lot of reprogramming to yes. get It's overcome. not your fault. It's not, you're, you're suffering. Like it, yeah. I, I think sometimes it's hard for us to, accept that you know it's like let let people help you let the people who right. love you help you it, you know it's we don't have to always be strong all the time right. it's okay oh and, yeah and and people yeah. want to and I, I always say that receiving is giving because when you're when you allow people to give to you you give them that wonderful feeling that they everybody likes to have everybody loves to give I hear that all the time yeah oh I'm a, I'm a I'm a giver, but I'm a terrible receiver. And I always say, well, you're selfish then because you're robbing people. You're robbing everybody <laughs> right. else of being a giver. And you got to be the giver all the time. Quit it. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, right. Oh. And I'm sorry. One other thing I would just add, I think there is that overlay that even different from cancer or broken leg or any of those, heaven forbid, because it's the brain, the brain is telling that person they don't deserve your help. I know. So it's even yeah, worse. So right. you got to come in with a lot of gentleness, totally. a lot of compassion and just fill the freezer anyway. Totally. You know? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Understanding yeah. that they're not going to be able to quote unquote, get out of that place. Don't expect them to. It's, it's okay. And just love and be there and support. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I wanted to talk about trauma, shadow work, you know, that I, I read about that when I was reading about you. Is there, forgive my ignorance with bipolar, I'm probably a great interviewer for my audience that they're, you know, we're in the same boat, <laughs> You're great. You're is, there, is there a trauma connection to bipolar? Is it completely genetic, genetic? You know, what have you learned as you've looked into this more? Is, are those correlated or kind of independent uh, factors? Well, well this is again, like, this is where I have uh, pre-K, not even kindergarten knowledge, but okay. I'll tell you okay. what's really fascinating to me is that recently they have identified a gene for bipolar. That's, yeah. you know, we assumed a genetic, now there is a, a genetic marker, which is fascinating. So there is that gene um, and a lot to be learned about that, you know, mm -hmm. but in addition, when you ask about trauma, so you know about ancestral trauma and you know about epigenetics. Yeah. Yes. Have you talked about yes, this I on do. the show? Right. Uh, so, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. So epigenetic, and again, I'm like a, a beginner, but I, I find it fascinating. Epigenetics are those changes that aren't actually physically, changing the gene, but they're changing the way the gene is expressed. Yes. A protein or something. So metaphor that I've heard, which I think is really helpful is um, like a dimmer switch on a light. The epigenetics of light can go up or light can go down. Mm -hmm. So you could have epigenetic changes as a result of ancestral trauma. Yes. And yes. there's a uh, woman named Rachel Yehuda, you may know out of Mount Sinai, and she proved this with Holocaust survivor, the children of children. They had that ancestral tra trauma epigenetic thing passed down mm -hmm. to them. And she also linked um, linked that to brain changes or brain issues. Now, I don't think it's it is been proven that's linked to bipolar, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it may not, may not be too far, you know? Yeah, it's an interesting thing to consider. And I do, I do DNA analysis in my coaching. And, you know, one thing I've been fascinated that I've dabbled in this whole, yeah. you know, I, I love epigenetics. I love Dr. Yeah, so Lipton, I, love, I love all of this, but 
you know, I look at one of my genetic mutations personally is a slow, calm T, which will cause you to have higher adrenaline. Right. And I, I kind of wonder because my mom, you know, my, my, the marriage of my parents, what I've heard from my older siblings who can remember it, you know, she, I mean, already she had so much life trauma being orphaned at five years old through a very traumatic event. And, and then on top of it, this very unhealthy screaming, fighting relationship with my dad. And I'm, you know, here I am, I'm conceived and I have this genetic mutation that causes me to hold on to adrenaline for 40% longer than other people. I find that Uh intriguing. It could be unrelated. It could not, but I definitely find it interesting, you know, and I actually, I actually do have genetic high genetic risk for bipolar schizophrenia, autism, ADHD, a lot of the, you know, the dopamine genes that are correlated with those, but there's, it's multifactorial. I have looked into schizophrenia and bipolar a little bit because I'm obsessed with neurotransmitters. Yeah. It's, interesting. it's not just one neurotransmitter. It's not just GABA. It's not just dopamine. Yeah, there's, it's a, it's a symphony. And yeah. when I say, okay, wow, it looks like no one fully understands this. And I definitely don't. So I'll kind of back off a little bit. It's but, interesting though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to continue the inquiry, I mean, I have a, I say in the book, uh, the brain is as vast as the universe and equally uncharted, right? Yeah. I mean, there's an infinity of, of research 100%. to do there. But I do think personally intuitive, again, I'm no professional, that there is a link between uh, ancestral trauma, epigenetic changes, that's Rachel Yehuda, change of the brain, also her, and then there's a genetic marker for bipolar. It's There's got to be something in there, right? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. I've got to ask you, cause I mean, your, your professional history is pretty outstanding, right? You've, you know, worked with over 50 country, 50 enterprises, sorry, thousands of individuals. You've worked with Nike, MIT, Ben and Jerry's, Eileen Fisher, and, and, and doing, uh, consulting work. Is that. Yeah. Coaching? I was a coaching? sustainability consultant. So, um, environmental and social justice issues, it included coaching. Cause a lot like you, we talked earlier, Tara, before we got on, Uh, my thing was sustainability from the inside out or systems transformation from the inside out. So we'd work with individual leaders and we'd also work with the team and the corporate level. So all, all levels. Yeah. And I think it's amazing that, you know, it's inspiring that you've, you know, had these issues that you've been, you know, on this 25 year plus path of understanding we're still, you know, your mom, you're still able to do that. Um, I kind of going back to like your basics, you know, you talked about the basics that you keep in place. Like, what do you think has allowed you to be able, you know, cause I, I would imagine if I was going in periods of like severe depression, it'd be real, real hard to show up at work and like perform like, uh, yeah. you know, can you share insights along that journey, you know, with parenting and just, it's a lot of demand. Yeah. I mean, I got to tell you virtually impossible, but the thing there is I got to give credit to my husband because we were also working together during mm-hmm. those periods. And my depressions wouldn't be all the time. I have yeah. several years good and then crash and years mm-hmm. good crash. And then once I got medication on board, then I've been good mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, but so for the periods that I was down at that point, you know, I'm in my career and I'm in a mom and I got Joe and he's awesome. a rock, a rock. You know, I, I, there's a chapter Joe's a rock and he's kind of funny. Appreciate this humor. Um, cause he completely doesn't believe this. He's teasing. He goes, I love the book. I love everything you're doing. And I'm so proud of you. The only problem is the title. It should have been Joe is a rock. You know? <laughs> so, um, so it, but I was very fortunate, you know, cause my mom didn't have this. My dad wasn't capable in this way. Um, that Joe just picked up the pieces, mm. you know, and he kind of covered for me, you know, when, so that I could show up to a client, but instead of leading, he'd be leading mm. or, beautiful. um, yeah. So I was very, very lucky in that way. Mm. Yeah. Not everybody's got that. So support, uh, it's support really network. hard to function, impossible, very d- difficult to function. Yeah, I think physically, I don't look that different. So it's easy to, um, if people aren't looking at what I'm saying or, or what capacity I have to follow through, if they're not thinking about the usual Sarah, if they're just looking at me physically, it's like, oh, I don't look that different. Yeah, they would never. So in a million they years. can, oh, <laughs> she's not having a good day or let Joe lead this conversation. You know, so I felt horrible and I knew that I wasn't showing up and I knew I couldn't follow, but mm. they didn't know. <laughs> and well, as I, I just get, handed all the leadership roles to him. Well, what a man. Good job, Joe. Way to show up. Good man. job, Joe. <laughs> yeah, he did. And I don't know if you don't have that. It's tough, yeah. but you got to f- other people to cover for you yeah. or, or, you know, help. Hopefully you have enlightened um, employer. 
Wow. You know, now we're talking about destigmatizing and more employers understanding. And there's a, I call it the pandemic induced mental health tsunami. So many people are sick, you know, so many people are having breakdowns, you know, so maybe, maybe you have leadership that understands that gives people a break, mm. you know. Last thing I got to ask, just because of my health nerd side, have you ever had, have you had um, times in your journey in which you let go of health basics and notice that that like made things worse or not really? I'm just curious. Or oh, maybe yeah, to totally. totally. I mean, again, when if I'm actively sick, if I'm in an active bipolar depression, I can't do anything really. Yeah. I mean, I, I would drag yeah. myself outside for hike. I, you know, right, if right. Somebody's, <laughs> somebody's feeding me healthy, I will eat it. Otherwise, I'm not going to eat healthy. Right. I can't <laughs> meditate. By the way, meditation is counterindicated for somebody with a brain like that because your brain is telling you everything that's wrong with you. Oh, so it's yeah. actually the opposite. I've learned, right. you know, I actually have a friend whose kid is doing his postdoc on that. Like meditation is great as a preventive, do it, do yeah. it, do it. But once they're right. sick, don't ask them to do it. Right. Okay. So right. I can't do any of the good behaviors really. So it's, that's a mess as a prequel, as a preventive, as a, um, what I call them, the packs, what I call them, like, you know, practices for healthy brain preventive. I think those are all really important. And I notice if I'm not doing them. Yeah. I yeah. Do my, I, I, I'm like a religious, you know, I have to do yeah, it yeah. every day. Right. You know, well, pretty much, I guess all of us and that, and I love you sharing that too. You're like, even if you're being preventative, you know, like that's the, the side of genetically inherited mental health issues. Like it's not enough. It's not, and I, I agree with you. Like I think if, if you haven't known someone closely, that's dealt with these things. And, you know, it's like, maybe you just be like, oh yeah, you can just, you know, work, work out and eat right. And it's like, dude, there's, right. it, it just comes, it's just, right. it, it just happens sometimes, you know? So, I, I, yeah, I mean, there's a whole other program probably Tara, but I think that it's probably, it may be correlated with intense levels of stress. So you yeah, have to, I think I the preventive that, yeah. for, for preventive for me is really paying attention to that. It takes me yes. a long time to yes. believe. That. So now yeah. I won't do it. Like, oh, I mean, we could go on and on, but there's an absolute circadian rhythms. You can't yeah. stay up all night, kiddo. Right. You just can't because that's a trigger for bipolar. Totally. So mm. you did it when your daughter was little and she wasn't breathing. Next time you have to have Joe help. You can't right. be the only go to. You know, I love that. They're going overseas. You're maybe not going this time because you can't screw up your sleep patterns. Yes. I love that. That self-care, that self-loving. Okay. What did I learn from that? And that's all part of removing shame, removing stigma. It's just like, okay, that happened. Like, what can I learn? And you're exactly what you're like, oh, staying up all night. Like I can't out of basic self-care, basic, the most basic of basic self-care. Like, look what happened when I stayed up all night. No. I will not, right. I will find exactly. solutions so that I, I, that is a absolute no. Okay. And, and I, I do, I do see stress as triggers for all sorts of, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, something as on bipolar spectrum, or it's just anything else. Honestly, I saw that with my mom with what I believe was schizophrenia. It's just like being able to watch out for yourself, have your own back enough to know what spirals you and say, no, you know, I, right. I, at least for me too, even though I don't feel like I have mental illness or mental health issues, I still know that if I start saying yes to a bunch of stuff, like I will feel crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I don't want to feel like I won't, I won't. Yeah. You know? exactly. And so learning those, learning yourself. And There's like, a big self-awareness component. And I yes. say, I now have a healthy respect for my bipolar brain. So yeah. I am going to honor it and, not love it and do everything I can to protect it. <laughs> and, you know, and I, uh, yeah, I that's, love that's, that. that's for our next conversation. I love you that. Can invite um, me back. <laughs> that is such a great mindset around it. It's a healthy respect. <laughs> it's like, I got you. Okay. Okay. I'm listening. Love exactly. it. Thank you so much. Okay. So the book um, is where's the best place to get this brainstorm from broken to blessed on the bipolar spectrum. Well, if you see my name and maybe you'll put the link under sarahschlick.com, yes. okay. uh, that's my website. And right there, there'll be, you can click to buy it from Amazon. You can click to buy it from your local bookstore, whichever you prefer. Awesome. And if um, you're just listening and you guys want to know, it's S-A-R-R-A -R -R without an H. Okay. So just like my name, yeah. Sarah, and then, <laughs> right. uh, with an S and then S-C-H-L-E-Y.com. And of course we will link that up. We'll put a link to the book directly as well. Uh, where else? Where else would you like? I to just got to tell you one other thing. This is, we are also working on a film. Um, oh, wow. the same name brainstorm. I'm working with some PBS Emmy award winning 
producer, Amazing. writer, documentarian, which is awesome to awesome. shine a light on the bipolar spectrum that nobody yes. knows about. So yeah. there'll be some descriptions of that on the website too. And like a little Yay. teaser for the film and that kind of where you can find out more about the film. So, so good. Make sure you let me know. I'll share it on social. So oh, people cool. can, can see that All coming right. up. It's really needed. Sarah, thank you so much. It's been nice to, I guess, from my life journey to talk with someone who like was able to embrace and find their way out of it. And now it's helping others, you know, pulling them out of that with them and saying, Hey, it's okay. It's okay. Come here. Come here. Come here. Let's heal this stuff. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And, and it's a beautiful conversation with you, Tara. Likewise. I wish you the best. Likewise. Thank you.